Hey everybody, it's Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show, bringing you our episode with Chris Thomas King. Now listen, this was a live episode that we did before, but just in case you're on the podcast side, uh, go to the show notes to get the latest on Chris's album, Angola. All right, so Chris has been on the show several times. Uh, This time he's basically, we're the first people to get him as he emerges out of the COVID cave. You know, he had like a lot of us locked down and just said, I'm going to get to work creating something. And then as he was, you know, working on all his various projects, uh, the George Floyd situation happened and he was moved and he created an entire album talking about capturing this moment in time and illustrating the black condition for us in a way that I think is truly powerful. So I, I know you'll enjoy that, but also enjoy Chris just opening up his mind and having the first real interpersonal, interactive conversation he's had in, in months and months. So, yeah, this is a long episode, but I, I know it's worth it, and you'll enjoy the chat. By the way, joining me today co-hosting is Ryan Sullivan. He and I are working to support Trubify. But the the main thing here to understand about this is that Ryan is a lifelong musician, and so I know he asks some great questions and brings in a point of view that I think is really powerful. Okay, enough about that. Let me say this to you. Hey, this is the giving season. And if you can, and if you're a person who's like, our group is going to designate one charity this year that we always do in the fall, because this is the time of year when everybody gives money. Hey, could you do me a favor? We would love that to be us here at Save the Brave. Go to savethebrave.com. Oops, sorry. Go to savethebrave.org and click on the donate tab. You think I'd get that right. And then just drop that money in there. It would be a great way. If, if we're not your charity, though, go to charityontop.org. And buy a charity gift card for anybody. You don't have to actually send them a card. You can, but you can just say, hey, here's my gift to you. Here's $50 worth of charity. I've already covered all the costs and fees. Give it to whatever charity you want. And then there's a whole list of a million plus charity. I think it's like 15 million charities overall. Either way, if you're going to give, charity on top or save the brave. That's what, I, that's what I'm asking you to do. And if you're not giving an adult, you got to figure out some way to get involved. All right. One more thing I'm going to say to you. And I'm telling you, this is such a good episode. Hang in there for the full two hours because it just keeps going and going and going. Just get a lot of chores done. Hang out with us. Here comes Chris Thomas King. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is Sebastian Yoga. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> This is Chris Thomas King, and you're watching Break It Down. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, man, we got Chris Thomas King back on the Break It Down Show, uh, in part because uh, we, you know, we always appreciate what he's doing and everything. By the way, I'm in the uh, jump studio. It got too noisy with the jackhammer outside, so I had to hop inside. But uh, Chris has put out a new album called Angola, and I want to talk about that. But I wanted to find out the status of your um, of Tabby's. Is it open and running? How is COVID? Because we li- we did a show like right as COVID was, you know, building into uh, a small crest. Yeah, uh, Tabby is, is uh, it's kind of on the shelf because of, uh, you know, because of COVID-19, but it's, you know, we just have, we're in limbo, you know, the business is just trying to hang on. The actual Tabby, Red Stick Social is the name of the, of the um, entertainment center where Tabby uh, partnered with. And uh, I think we, yeah, when we did a podcast, I think earlier this year, we were supposed to have like a grand opening in uh, May to coincide with the New Orleans Jazz Festival with the Baton Rouge Blues Festival. And in, in between that time, we were supposed to do some uh, aesthetic uh, things to the acoustics of the building because it's this old hundred year old building, but the acoustics haven't been treated. So music just reverberates all through the place. So it's not, wasn't ready for prime time. And so that's, you know, things are just basically put on the shelf. Hopefully we can get it going maybe next spring. If if we can survive COVID-19. Right, right. Well, yeah. are you pretty optimistic about the survival part? Uh, 50-50. I mean, we wow. have some new management that came in, which is kind of, um, you know, slow things down a little bit. 
and we really haven't had any meetings on what we're going to do about tab is anything you know in, in some months here so i think we'll assess things toward the end of the year and kind of just see where we are because the whole in louisiana where i'm where i'm at you know we've been shut down you know since since early march and it don't look like any live entertainment or music or festivals anything like that is going to be happening you know until maybe next spring if we can survive that long then we'll make tabbies happen but if not uh if we don't survive the COVID 19 and we can't work things out um there's still a possibility that that i might do like a tabbies uh, museum or something in a different format you know to try to you know perpetuate this blue story and keep that that culture alive you know and and preserve it you know for for new generation it's a beautiful so if, we space. Do it in a, if we can't do it in a big commercial establishment uh we might have to do it in a non-profit setting but so it, it's like everything else in america right now it's in limbo man you know it's in limbo and i don't know i mean we we're, we're hoping we can get back to business i'm hoping i can get my band back on the road but right now i'm kind of worried about whether or not civilization is gonna is going to uh continue you know i mean yeah. it's it's pretty dark right now the the space is absolutely beautiful i mean it'd be uh i'd, I'd i'm an, i'm a silver lining optimistic kind of guy i work with a lot of touring musicians and i specifically like help manage and build brands for individual artists not just the you know recording artists the you know the actual musician and you know, that's what I, I keep telling them. I'm like, look, you know, it's the, I like to think with, you know, all major pushes in civilization, social change, like it's always been forced out of really negative reasons, whether it's like advancements in technology due to, we have to, we have to do this because of the bad things going on. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like when Napster, you know, came about, like, in, you know, the first kind of a downloading or like early streaming, it was a you know, a really kind of scary time, but then now it's like we've all adapted to it, and now it's just like everyone's used to making a tenth of a penny on a stream. But <laughs> I'd like to think that you know touring is going to come back, and I mean, but uh, the with I'm curious, like with with Tabby's, like you know, I'm I'm such a music junkie and a music nerd. Like I'd love to hear a little bit of the, you know, is that where you first got you know birthed into music, so to speak, because of what your dad was doing there, <clears throat> um, and like you know what. Well, just kind of like, I'd love to hear a little bit of like how that was a part of your, your childhood or like, and you know, the inspiration that got you where you're here now. And I mean, cause it's an absolutely gorgeous building, like from like the, just the insides, all the brick, the, you know, I mean, it looks absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Well, um, uh, there's a lot of potential there. Um, I, um, uh, I grew up right there with it, what this building is. I mean, this building came in, I hear an echo. You guys hear that echo? Yeah, I'm not sure. Is it? Do you have headphones? That might be the answer. I'm not sure exactly why it's doing it. I'm trying to figure it out on my end. Of luck, I actually don't. Hear yeah, that. I don't know. I don't, I don't, yeah, but anyway, yeah. Um, I uh, I grew up right there. My, my dad's what what this what this tabbies, uh, what what Red Stick Social is that is to become tabbies. Uh, Back during the Storyville days of New Orleans, when they had this red light district, well, Baton Rouge had a red light district called um, on a street called Red Stick, and so it was kind of a zone where you know all the vices and stuff could happen without being bothered. And fast forward to um, 1979 is when my dad got an idea to open a little joke joint. He opened a took over a grocery store there and converted it into uh, a blues club. And this was at the height of disco and at the height of, um, you know, when there weren't a lot of uh, recognition or places to play for, for blues musicians in Louisiana. And he kind of brought back uh, that whole um, kind of reconnected Louisiana, which is the birthplace of the blues, and kind of gave a, a new generation guys like myself, of, of course, his son. I, I was forced, you know, to play at the family business, but and pay fifteen how, how old were, how old were you when dollars you, a night, you know. But how old were you when you started playing there? Uh probably fourteen or fifteen. Nice. But uh so he he uh opened this place and it became a, a hot thing. And uh even though it was a ramshackle little jump joint where the beer the beer cooler didn't cool, the, the water closet didn't always work. 
but the music was was always infectious. So, and it caught on. Uh, a lot of people that like the blues thing, they romanticize this um, downtrodden, you know, kind of mythology about the blues, the, the some kind of backwood juke joint, moonshine type of spot. And we didn't try to make it that, but that's kind of what it was, you know? And so it started attracting tourists, like sometimes we'd have buses pull up from uh, unannounced, you know, some French tourists or something would just pull up and all of a sudden we had to try to accommodate, you know, 70 uh, tourists in the place and stuff. So it got, it became a thing, but as my dad uh, uh, got a little bit ill, the city of Baton Rouge raised the place in, in uh, 1999. Mm. And ever since then, uh, I have been wanting to kind of reestablish it in some way, but without being like my dad, you know, uh, tethered to the business. I mean, he is like a, it's running a little club like that. And then he performed and played there as, as well. I would be, I wouldn't be able to do acting. I wouldn't be able to do a lot of writing. I wouldn't be able to tour my band. I would be tied to a, a club you know, uh, 24 seven, seven days a week. And I don't want to um, commit to that, at least not at, not at, not at this point. So having partners and coming up with a, a fabulous uh, set of that, like we have, these guys came in and it was like a gentrification kind of thing. The, the neighborhood, the black neighborhood, very poor, but it's being gentrified. And this is one of the big gentrification things. And uh, so there was a lot of pushback from the black community, the community that I grew up in. And I think they brought me in as a public relations deal. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, man, I don't do, you know, I don't do this kind of thing. You know, I'm not just some symbolic guy you hire. Right. And it's like, and I'm going to advertise your business and smooth right. over your public relations. Don't, don't check the box with my name. Yeah, I'm not one of these kind of rappers that looking to do branding, you know. Yeah. So it's like if you if I have ownership in the in the business, and and then you know, and if you guys want me to perform there, then these are the things we need to do, and and if we want to create an atmosphere that's worthy of my my dad's and my legacy, then here's my plan, and it was going to cost because they was going to have to modify the building. You know, and there were some things that we needed to do, which they promised they would get to, and those things will be done hopefully by May uh, of, of of 2020, in time for Jazz Fest, you know, Blues Festival festival season, and we would have a big grand opening. But COVID-19 put a damper on that. Some some management changes put a damper on that, and right now the business is just trying to. It, it's only open now. It's not even open. It's only uh, doing takeout, like you mm. can, you know, get some takeout food there or something. But with that kind of, uh, with the kind of uh, lease and the kind of expenses that a place like that um, has, it's very tough to kind of survive this, this, uh, this time we're in. So it's a commercial building. It's not a nonprofit, you know, blues foundation kind of thing. So. I, because if it was, I could go to some oil companies and say, hey, man, break me yeah. off a little something. You know what I mean? <laughs> there are some wealthy people out there that would be happy to contribute, you know, to a community uh, institution, you know, like that. But that's not where we are right now. It's a commercial thing. And so we just have to see if it survives and then we'll kind of reassess things. But my ownership in the building and in, not in the building, we have a lease, but my ownership in the business is uh it, it is what it is but even if they turn it into an ice cream stand i'm still a part owner so it's not contingent on me performing there or it's not contingent on it being converted into tabbies i'm still an owner no matter what they do and until they buy me out so that's kind of where we are you know yeah for those that uh, aren't aware um chris is obviously a musician and an actor and uh, uh i guess you, you, I'm trying to think. How do you describe your role in Lackawanna Blues? Like you're you're part actor, part you know pit band. What do you describe that role as? That's such a unique thing. Lackawanna Blues, uh, the play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your role in that? Would you say? Oh, I'm a, I'm an actor, but I'm I'm also a film scorer and the music director of the play. Yeah. But I do all of that on stage. You know, I compose the music 
that that supports the the play, and I'm on stage, you know, performing the music, and I'm working with um, Ruben Santiago Hudson, who is a, a just an amazing actor. He plays like 23 characters, I think, <laughs> and voices women and men, you know, in this play as he tells this story about uh, migration, you know, people that migrated from the South up to New York, uh, Lackawanna, New York, uh, near Buffalo and in the 1950s. And he grew up in a boarding home and he talks about all the different characters and stuff and bring those characters to life in that place. And music was always happening in that, in that space. And so that's what we recreate on stage with, you know, it's a beautiful setting with light, lighting and set design and stuff that kind of brings you into that world. And, um, uh, and it's a, it was a, we, we did, we did the uh, play in LA, um, some months ago and it was a real, it was a, a, an amazing success. And right now, um, I guess this is a little breaking news, but we, uh, are going to Broadway in August from August. Uh, we begin in August of 2021 and run until the holidays right around uh, November. And the theater has an option, you know, to continue it. So we go on to Broadway officially, like an official Broadway. I'll be in New York doing that uh, if we can get past COVID-19 um, beginning in August of uh, next year. So Lackawanna wow. Blues is an amazing play. And, um, you know, so we were hoping to get to Broadway. <laughs> I remember we talked about this. Yeah. yeah. And so we're in negotiations right now, but I think all of that is, is going to be smoothed out. So, so yeah. Like if you guys don't Broadway. get it already, it's such a great, I mean, it's kind of a play, kind of a musical. And, and Chris really is on stage the entire time. That's why I kind of struggle to describe what he does, but he's, making the soundtrack for this thing live with his guitar. And it's just such a fantastic man. It's just such a great play. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for letting me uh, come and watch it. It was at the Amundsen. I think that we saw it and what a, what a treat you guys. Definitely. If you're in New York, definitely go see it. Don't miss it out. And hopefully COVID won't keep you guys from being on stage. Cause it's a, uh, it's a great couple of hours to spend with someone that you love and watch an amazing tale. Hey, let's talk about, uh, I want to, I always want to talk about the history of the blues with you, but let's do that for another episode. Let's talk about Angola. I mean, this is your current thing and it seems like you put this thing together pretty fast. I mean, it's, it's uh, I was listening to it and I thought uh, before I read your blog about it, but um I heard the Marvin Gaye in it. I heard all the different influences. You don't care what genre something's in. You just go to where the art is. And I also heard a lot of like songs in the key of life kind of stuff where we're taking the current times and putting it into your music. Tell us about Angola. Yeah. Um, Angola is an al- is my new album. It came out September 11th, um, digitally worldwide. So wherever people get music, they can check it out. Spotify, iTunes, Pandora and just about anywhere else. And even at my website, christhomasking.com. But uh, Angola, first of all, the name comes from uh, the state prison here in Louisiana, called, um, which is called Angola. Uh, and they call it the Angola State Farm. And this was a notorious uh, state prison, not that it's not anymore, but it was a very, a real, one of the most notorious prisons in America. Uh, and Chain gang leasing is is what was their specialty. They they created a lot of, like these black codes and things to, you know, get black people in 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 chains, you know, after slavery, and then they would lease them out to do to businesses to do all kinds of uh, agricultural and uh, you know levy work or whatever needed needed done and uh, needed to be done railroad stuff and all of that and. Um, and so, and, and that's also where Lead Belly came out of, you know, the Angola State Prison. And uh, it's not, not far from where I live. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. And uh, it's not not far from where I live. Um, so the album, I had uh, like the song, the first single from the album, Nine Pound Steel, is a song that when you hear the introduction of the song, 
you hear the the I, I, there was a sample that I used of of uh, chain gang workers on uh, the steel hitting the rocks and the grunts from the men, and I put that in, sampled that and, and chopped it up a little bit and put it in time to the beat. So that's the backbeat of the tune, and then I took I used my guitar to create an ethereal type of uh, setting for it uh, by using uh, I'm not gonna get too technical, but you know. A certain way you play the guitar and you make it sound kind of like a synth or something, you know, and it create a bed, like an atmospheric bed. It's not, it might sound like a keyboard, but it's all guitar. You can get technical. That's what I was going to be asking some of the nerdy gear questions. <laughs> it's just like, well, no, what MIDI patches were you using? But yeah, well, what I did is that what, running my Stratocaster guitar through uh, a Lexicon PCM70 and, and using reverb and running it through another PCM70, and then you get that ethereal sound. That's the kind of sound that that haunting sound that you might find on uh, uh what these guys uh they used to produce YouTube back in the eighties um you know they were they were known for that the guy's name um uh, Daniel Lanois and Brian yeah, Eno yeah Brent, Daniel Lanois and Brian Eno you know that's, that's that's one of their techniques you know but it, they're usually using keyboards I'm using a guitar and kind of um creating something like that so. So yeah, and so you get so you you welcome people to that sound, and then the tune uh, is a cover of a Percy Sledge tune, which is a country soul type of thing. So that's the to me. I ha I had that song, um, a demo of that song, sitting sitting around and not quite knowing what to do with it. You know, uh, what album to, to put it on and things like that. And and then you know when when this happened, and I was watching. Uh, uh, after George Floyd was um, was murdered and the whole world kind of stopped. Uh, I don't have television, so I normally see things. I, I normally listen to, to, to the news. I don't watch the news uh, unless I see a clip of something online. But anyway, um, I was watching this, following the protests through uh, Periscope and through people's cell phones and things. And after a day or two of watching that, then I decided I wanted to record the audio that I was hearing because I thought it was just amazing. And, you know, of course, the broadcast news channels like CNN and them, they don't, you know, they, they, they really don't tell the story from the, from, the, from the street. And after recording that, then I said, I, gotta, I just wanted to play some guitar or put some beats to it. Or do so I started experimenting with it. And that was the birth of the album. You know, uh, the the songs Nine Pound Steel is the anchor, but then capturing the, the sounds of protests and the sounds of the uprising uh, and trying to use those voices in that and all that chaos and trying to create some art out of that chaos was which which is what I was trying to achieve. Did you have similar to Nine Pound Steel that was a demo prior going into it? Did you is that kind of how all the songs that made it were, you know, roughly? you know, demoed or put together? Like how many did you have, you know, conceptualized prior to this release? Or did you have some that like immediately, you know, once nine pounds steel, you had that kind of put together, then the rest kind of followed suit or were these combined works you had going on prior? Yeah, that's a good question. I had, well, nine pounds steel was in kind of a demo form um, on not unfinished, but the Bob Dylan tune that's on the album, um, I Shall Be Released. Right. I, I recorded that a while back, but just hadn't released it. And uh, and that's another song about a prisoner who is innocent, who is in in prison, and he's waiting for you know uh, for you know hoping to, to 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 get released or whatever. So that that theme and then nine pound steel those kind of went together. But uh, is there anything else? Um, yeah, there's another tune called uh, uh, Jenna, Louisiana which uh, I was actually recording for my new album. I mean, I wasn't planning on doing an album about George Floyd. I didn't know that was right. going to happen. Right. But Jenna Louisiana was going to be on an album that I was working on. And that's the only song on the album that was going to be released this year um, that made it on this album. And that was a, that's another song about uh, a, a young man uh, in Jenna Louisiana where the police um, brutalized him like they've done, like we've seen so many times on social media. And then uh, he didn't have a weapon. And so they said his shoe was his weapon. 
and they tried to make it like his shoe with the murder weapon and all this, or the attempted murder weapon of the police. And they were going to lock this this kid up for like a lifetime, if, or you know, for the rest of his life. Al Sharpton came down and tried to bring some attention to the case and stuff like that. And so General Louisiana is a true story that I kind of based uh, that song on. And so, but but everything else you hear is just things that I think the album came, those songs came together in a matter of a day or two. It really did. It was like just a burst of inspiration, you know, um, over a couple of nights, you know, and uh, and then it was just a matter of you know where things, you know, how to how to how to lay out the suite of songs. What would be the first song people would hear, and so on and so forth. What was what was your? It's it, it's a stupid, well, not a stupid question, but I I just I'd love to hear your response. I I work with a lot of Jamaican musicians and a lot of uh, reggae artists, but uh, you know, so I always you know there this the, the this question why I say that is you know what were did you go through just like a range of emotions when you were putting this together because you know from frustration, inspiration, like. How did you feel like when you're doing this? Like, and, and were you concerned at all about you know the the perception of it? Like, with, you know, because there was no shortage. Y- yours was a very thoughtful piece of work, right? And then, but you know, over the last like five months, there's been a lot of music coming out to um, put spotlight on what's going on and artists using their voice. Like, how just what was kind of your? How'd you feel like putting these together? And like when you actually saw the finished work, like you know, what was it? Um, What's the response been like? What kind of range of emotions are you going through? You know, this has been a, you know, probably a product of your entire life that you're able to kind of put into, um, you know, a, a piece of work. Like, well, you know, yeah, just give you give some insights. What was that was like? Um, so that's not as much of a technical question as you know, just my emotional thoughts behind you know what it what it feel like putting it together. Uh, I don't know what to say to that. I'm kind of speechless because the technic the technical aspect of it kind of overwhelms the the emotional thing happens in the performance, but it's all one take. I mean, I, I don't like do two, three, four, five takes. It's not a long thing. You know, I'm fortunately I can go into a studio by myself and do the engineering, play all the different instruments, the bass, the guitars, the keyboards, sing the harmony. You know, I can make an album. I know everybody was quarantining. And some artists can only just maybe get their guitar and, and sing on online, but I'm I was able to actually, um, you know, play. I actually own a studio, have a studio, recording studio, and, and I can go in the studio, engineer, make an album, master it, do the whole thing myself if I choose to do that. And so I wasn't hindered by any any um, anything, but. Emotionally, it's hard. It was more technical than anything else. The emotional part is is when I've kind of finally put it all together, and how, and and then I had to I had to figure out how to put it together because I love like what's going on. You mentioned what's going on, where uh, songs just kind of seamlessly flow from one to the next, and I'm like, well, how do I do that? And it's not an album; it's digital, you know. So. Uh, you know, are people even going to listen to the thing in, as, a, as a piece of work? Or are they going right. to just have it on a playlist, individual little, track little track. tunes? And, you know, and I'm thinking Pink Floyd, you know, some of my Pink Floyd favorites. I'm thinking Marvin Gaye. And I'm like, I want this thing to go seamlessly, but I'm not even sure the digital uh, websites uh, allow you to do that. Maybe there will be a break in between the songs that I can control. So, so a lot of the stuff was technical. So I figured out uh, a way to have one song stream into the next song and blend into the next song. And I kept a little motif tucked way underneath there. You hear just these two cards, these two minor cards going back and forth through the, throughout, almost throughout the whole thing to kind of tie it all together. So it's really like one long suite of music that hopefully brings the listener in and then keep them there for a while. So it was more technical than emotional, except for the performance. Now, when I sit back and I give me, give me some scotch or something, I hear the final product, you know, I hear the album kind of flow and say, okay, that everything is working. Because every time I hear the music, I hear something wrong. Mm. I, I don't get the emotional burst that the, that, the, that the person consuming it on the other end might get. For me, it's like... Uh, it, it, 
uh, you know, I, I'm sculpturing something and I, I, I got to keep chipping at it until I, I get something that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm happy with. And I'm not happy with it until it's finalized, you know, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that makes, makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, so the and emotional glad thing that... is, is it, it comes much later, it, except for that burst of inspiration during the performance. Well, I guess like my, my question on the motion, like with like, was that like, you know, obviously just a, probably a mix and it, you know, it, again, I, I feel like it's a stupid question, but I just, you know, I, I try to understand. But if you're talking about, if you're talking about the black experience. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, just obviously like, you know. What did, it say, what did it say in a social context about, you know, you know, where I stand in the world, or what my statement is, I think. I think the the music kind of speaks for itself, but a little bit of that has been in all of my albums all, all throughout the years. I've always been, uh, I'm not necessarily a political writer. You know, I'm no Bob Marley, don't get me wrong, but I'm no Bob Marley, I'm not, uh, I'm not Ice Cube or anything like that. But I haven't shied away from uh, social issues and, and, and uh, you know, hints of politics and things and and the oppression you know of, of of black people in america and my music it's it's been in there pretty much from day from from day one and uh you know going back to probably the most uh probably the most um antagonistic album that i recorded is an album called that's hard to find these days called 21st century blues from the hood which came out in the early 90s which was the first rap hip-hop blues album which caused me to leave America and have to go live in Europe because blues festivals wouldn't book me. You know, I was kind of banned, you know, from the whole blues you thing. You didn't fit in and their still, box. And still today, I'm an outsider. Uh, you'll never, you know, I don't, you know, get blues recognition and things. You know, I kind of operate, uh, I'm a maroon, you know what I mean? I operate off the grid from the rest of the blues world and I kind of do my own thing. And um, that's probably arrogance a little bit because, but I don't think it's arrogance as much as it is in that I, I think I have the true, um, the true philosophy of this music is wrapped up in, 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 in my musical philosophy. And I just think that the blues establishment from the Grammys to the, to the Memphis Blues Awards and all the stuff that folklorists have written in these books and these researches and stuff, all of that is like mythology, propaganda, bullshit, whitewashing, and thievery of my culture. So I've been going my own way, you know, for for decades. So this new album uh, is it, it's a timely thing because the world sometimes is not ready to listen to a song like Nine Pound Steel. Mm. And that's why, you know, fit, fitting out on an album, it's, it's too good of an album, it's too good of a song. Sometimes, sometimes something is just too good to just throw it out there. But for, for a lot, not just for my music, but just in general, when it comes to, um, to white supremacy and what's wrong with this society and how structural racism works, it just so happens that the world stopped. People had time for... for um, for reflection, and I have a song on the album called "The Reckoning," and you know, so we're in a reckoning right now, where all these institutions are kind of coming out and confessing. Yes, I was always a racist institution, but I'm trying to do better. Like LA Times, I think, just came out this week saying that apologizing for being a racist, you know, uh, white supremacist newspaper for its entire history, and kind of promising to to make amends, you know? And that's happened with National Geographic, it's happened with museums. I think the the Oscars is saying that you have to have a certain amount of black uh, talent behind the scenes as writers, producers, actors in a movie just to, or else you're not gonna be qualified to be a uh, movie of, you know, uh, what it is, the movie of the year, uh, Oscar or something. Then you won't qualify if you don't have these um, things happening. So every everybody, all these businesses is, is going through that. Now I'm not naive. I know that businesses are just trying to survive. They're just trying to put some lipstick on this pig. Oh, yeah. you know it's, I mean? it's a yeah. There's a lot of stuff that are doing a PR move out of it. And, exactly. You know, and, and that's yeah. why, like, kind of like with my question, you know, asking because there's been a lot of artists putting out, you know, music topical music over the last four months, and it's that kind of 
that, you know, it's, it's tough. I, I work with some of these artists that are, have been putting music out or decided not to put music out because, you know, they've been doing a message. You know, this has been your entire life, right? So it's not you putting this music out now isn't a PR move, right? This is just the embodiment of your entire fucking life and saying like, well, now's the time I fucking need to put this out. And, and that's where like, I think it's been a, it's been an interesting challenge. People trying to find their, you know, the, the voice during this to make sure it's not like, Oh, I don't want to be perceived as a PR thing. Or, you know, I, I've, I've represented reggae artists and Jamaican artists since I've been doing my, my LLC. And it was kind of, you know, it, it hit me at the start. Well, really over the last six months of kind of, I've always, you know, me and my clients, especially in Jamaica, ask the questions like, well, why has reggae never really blown up in the States? And it's, you know, it's kind of similar to how, you know, jazz, blues, it's always been just kind of put into a, you know, and I don't say it lightly, a systemic oppression of the genre of who's controlled the record labels from when, you know, what really popularized uh, the rap category in hip hop, it was gangster rap and NWA, which was, you know, put out by big record producers to then paint this picture or perception of a culture. It's similar with reggae. Everyone thinks, oh, white kids, Bob Marley and weed where, you know, it's, it's deeper than that. So I, I, I appreciate that insight and, and letting, letting me stumble through the question. Cause it's, you know, I think it's important for people to hear, you know, from an artist like yourself who, you know, this, this isn't a relevant, this has been my entire life. Like that, you know, this is. Yeah. I mean, we've always been, when I say we, I mean, you know, uh, black people in America, We've always been painted as the monster, you know. We're the yeah. monster, the big bad oh, monster that's gonna jazz, come. the devil's lettuce, like you know. Yeah, man. Yeah. So you know, we've always been the monster, and sometimes you fight against that that image and that stereotype, and then sometimes you play with it. Sometimes you become Caliban, you know, and you know, like the the, the Shakespearean, you know, uh, Moore who was the monster or whatever, you know, sometimes you take, you become the monster and you say, Hey, you know, and you used it, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I've, 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 I've flipped the script and done that sometimes in my albums and sometimes, and that kind of t antagonizes my audience and try to wake my audience up. But at the same time, you know, blues have been so, it's not even a, the blues as we know it today, it's not a, a black musical genre. No, I mean, it, when there's... Yeah, it's like a poor man's rock genre, you know? Yeah. Oh, you know, there's, you know, guitar players out there like Eric Gales that, you know, he, sh he should have, you know, a similar platform like a Joe Bonamassa does. And, you know, it's not taken away from, you know, some of these these artists that are on these huge platforms. But, you know, it's, it's disproportionate to the opportunity of the authentic scene, the authentic musicians, you know, versus, again, who, who's getting popularized, who's getting more of the opportunities of playing, you know, blues, which, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, same as it ever was, you know. I mean, um, uh, one of my one of the people that I kind of model myself after is Jelly Roll Martin, you know. And Jelly Roll Martin, you know, was like, you know, ahead of his time and doing his thing. But when you compare Je what Jelly Roll Martin was making in 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 his heyday in the nineteen twenties to what Al Jolson was doing, I mean, Al Jolson made millions and packed arenas all over the place, you know. But I don't think anybody today, you know, want if you had a choice, you wanted to you wanted to be remembered as like a Jelly Roll more than Al Jolson. I don't. I think most people would would choose Jelly Roll. So just because you're the guy that's uh, selling out a theater, there's lots of Al Jolsons in the world today. You know what I mean? And let them have it. You know what I mean? But <laughs> some, someone like me, I'm not going to put on blackface and try to compete with Al Jolson. I'm gonna stay true to my art and stay true to myself. And, you know, um, when all of the, uh, when people become embarrassed and shamed and have to apologize and go through all this stuff about why they wore blackface and, you know, Al Jolson, he didn't really mean it. He was really a good person, but he, and all that old bullshit, you know, I don't have, I, I don't have to do that. I don't have to make apologies, you know, so. Have, have you found that hard throughout your career, like day in, day out? Because, you know, a lot of people outside looking in would see an artist like yourself and they you know assume make make big assumptions or same with a lot of tour and acts of just like oh they they have it made oh they're soup you know they're just rolling into all this stuff like have you has it I'm sh what's it been like staying true to your art craft and not you know not to use the word selling out but i mean like you know what what what's that been like um it's been um 
you know, like I said earlier, you know, I mean, it's been a, it's been it's been difficult because I like I, said, I had to move to Europe. I left America. I wasn't planning on coming back. I was an expa expatriate uh, living in London and eventually moved, um, you know, spent some time in France and then ended up living uh, for a couple of years in Copenhagen and Denmark. And I had no plans to come back to America. And, um, you know, so it's been a struggle, you know. Uh, now, while I was in uh, Scandinavia, uh, they didn't have black radio stations there, you know. They didn't have those kinds of boxes and boundaries and, and stereotypes, you know, for me. So it was in actually in Copenhagen that I created my first, what I would call my first, you know, album in my true voice, you know, which was 21st Century Blues from the Hood which was an album that I couldn't get made in America. Uh, I was recording for Warner Brothers at the same time that Ice-T and Body Count was recording for Warner Brothers. And my his album came, he was on Sire Records, Warner Brothers. I was on the same label. We were the only two black guys on the label. And we were both kind of, he was coming from hip hop and merging the guitar. I was bringing the guitar and hip hop together. Because at the time, everybody was saying that hip hop isn't real music because, you know, it's not played with, with guitars and real musicians. But one of the worst things you can do in America is be, is be a black man, you know, playing a guitar, you know, and, and playing this rebellious music, you know, thumbing your nose at the establishment and stuff. I mean, that's the last thing that, you know, that, they, that, that people in America wanted to promote. But uh, in Europe, you know, people were totally excited about it, you know. Um, and, and and that album that album did really well, but and there's a lot of reasons for that. You know that goes back to Chuck Berry. It goes back to it goes back to, to the beginning. Like I said, you know we're painted as the monster, and sometimes that's a good thing to to use that in your art. But then sometimes you know it's uh it's a hindrance. You know as far as getting your message and getting your music, you know out to the people. Uh, and speaking of art, I mean I see all of this through the guise of art. You know what I mean. I mean, art, if this was um, athletics, like a tennis court where everybody's playing by the same rules and everybody get, get a volley, you know, 15 love, whatever, playing by the same rules, then that's a different thing. You know, then you can really measure uh, a person's talent against another's. But in art, it's all subjective. And, and there's a lot of smoke and mirrors and a lot of fakery that goes on. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, because a lot of it, it's, it's a commercial business, right? Like you get you get to that blur that line of to being a professional musician where it's, you know, there's a the commercial aspect to it. And so it's always, you know, the respect that, you know, I got for a guy like you who has maintained a career to find that balance to not, you know, where you're, you're balancing that the art form, but then also the commercial viability of it to allow you to continue doing the art form for as a career. And how, how have you balanced that? I guess, I mean, you've kind of been answering it by, you know, going expat and going out to the UK to be able to, you know, find the, the voice there versus out here. And... Well, I mean, I've, you know, I'm, I think by blue standards, I've, I'm probably the most, it's ironic, you know, because, I mean, I'm not here complaining about my career, don't get me wrong. Um, but, uh, and, you know, just to kind of, for people that are listening that don't know my history and maybe don't know some things, let me just, you know, lay a little foundation of some thing. I, I think I've sold more records than any other blues artist in America in the 20th century. I've sold maybe about 13 million albums, 13 million records. Of course, a big bulk of that was from Old Brother Juan Arthur. And then down from the mountain uh, went platinum, a song that I wrote called John LaBrenda the Liquor Store went platinum, and that sold over a million copies. And the Ray Charles movie that I did, co-starred in with Jamie Foxx, uh, the score to that um, movie, we did two albums from Ray, and that was, I don't think it went platinum, but it, it, it hit the top of the Billboard charts. And then albums that I do on my own, they have done uh, very well too. Uh, so by, co by commercial standards, as far as my records go, uh, I don't think any other blues artists, white or black or Asian or Native American, have sold more records than I have sold. Um, I've played to sold out Carnegie Hall a couple of times, not on my own, but co-headlining with other artists. Uh, 
you know, uh, the theater in Harlem, Radio City Music Hall, a couple of times, Red Rocks, the Greek Theater, a few times in LA. All the great theaters, you know, all the great halls, I've done all of that. Uh, Nashville, uh, what's it called in Nashville? <laughs> Um, Ryman Grand Ole Opry. Yeah, the Grand Ole Opry. I've done the Grand Ole Opry. Matter of fact, I got album of the year, Bluegrass uh, uh, Award here. I've, I've been a CMA album of the year award. Uh, I have Grammy album of the year. I've won several Grammys. So I mean, I have all those successes. So um, I, I have the commercial success. I, so I know what that is. I'm not. And, you know, trying to, um, I'm not reaping or trying to get known or trying to, I've had success in the music, right. especially, especially as a blues artist. So uh, now as far as, as far as the structure of the music business, the way that works is uh, I own my own music, I own my masters, I own all of my publishing and all of my songwriting. So I'm only licensing music to Universal to, to Sony and places like that. So uh, I don't have uh, a publishing deal with anybody and I've been pro producing my own masters and only my own music since the early nineties. When I came back from Europe, I did my own thing. Now, when you're doing your own thing, it's a cartel. <laughs> the music business is a cartel. These, yeah. are, these are gangsters, man. You can't, <laughs> you can't go sell tickets to a concert without Ticketmaster selling the tickets, you know? Clear Channel plays the records. If you don't give Clear Channel three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000, they're not gonna play your record. And, and on and on and all these, and Clear Channel and Ticketmaster and these uh, booking agencies that control all the major festivals, uh, Coachella and all that stuff, this is a cartel. And if you're not part, if you're not signed and owned by that cartel, then you're blocked. And I'm okay with that. I don't mind. I don't mind being working with the with the gangsters, but I got to get my fair share. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, that, and people, that's most people make a lot of money for the business, but the money stays with the business. You can't leave the room with the money. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if you're chasing if you're chasing money and you want to have some kind of success in the music business. There's only two ways to do it. I don't care if you're Frank Sinatra or B.B. King. They were all managed by the mob, you know, and the mob is just gone legit. They call it William Morris Agency, like CAA. The These, this is the mob, but it's legit now. So, I, I mean, you know, because I, I know the blues. I mean, um, Duke Ellington and uh, Duke Ellington and um, King Oliver, and Louis Armstrong, and they, they played for the mob, you know, Al Capone. So they went to Chicago after they closed Storyville down, the Red Light District in New Orleans down. These guys moved up to Chicago to work for the gangsters in Chicago. While when Moonstown was illegal, then they can do all the, their stuff. So it just so happens that the mobsters in New York said, hey, man, I really like that band from, you know, from New Orleans. Can you send them over here for a couple of weeks to play at my speakeasies? And then I guess the gangsters started sharing this music, and then they started saying, hey, man, I'm going to need a percentage if you're going to take my hot group over to New York for a couple of weeks, then I need to get a cut, you know? And then they opened up Vegas, and they and they established themselves in L.A., and now they call the William Morris Agency. It's, it's gangster. So that's it. That's how that's that's the business. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that's what it is. And I'm saying that... Uh, Sometimes you can make a million dollars for in the music business and still not get a check. You know, sometimes it's better to just, you know, sell 10,000 records out the back seat of your car, <laughs> you know, and, and, and make $10 a record and you made a hundred grand. The Nipsey Hustle yeah. analogy, make your own mixtape, sell them at a thousand bucks a pop. Yeah. yeah. And, and now there's not even record stores. So why would you sign your life away? to these people um you know why would you sign your life away when everybody's just streaming music anyway yeah and i think and, you know the point of my question be, is yeah, yeah and used you, to be used to be you could you'd have a clause in your contract that say um that you can audit the record company you know to see how many records they printed so you can make sure you're getting paid and your accountants and lawyers could could verify that 
but there's nobody in the world that I know of that can audit Apple or audit Spotify and find out exactly and look at their books and see if they got paid, you know, for their streaming as according as to what's supposed to be. And I don't know any account that would even know how to deal with that. And all yeah. the minutia of all the, 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 the intricate little cents that was paid in Chile and Argentina and all, I mean, who, what accountant can even deal with this madness? So the way the business is structured now, you know, if you haven't, if you're not already bounded by these cartels, there's no reason to do it at this point, unless you're desperate, you know, and you really need a, a lump of money up front, then go for that. You know, I'm not knocking it. And I'm not knocking being a gangster, you know. <laughs> it's not prudish. I'm not, I'm not a Puritan or some pure prudish guy, you know. Uh, so I'm just saying that that's what it is. But so the way that we measure uh, success, you know, um, especially when you have black black people blocked out of the playing field, you know, like Ramblin University. I'm changing the subject a little bit, but to give you an analogy, if you won a football or basketball championship at a time that black people weren't allowed to play bas basketball, that's an embarrassing championship to, to put up in your trophy case. That's not, is that a, is that a championship at all? Because I'm sure that Grambling would have beat the lights out of Alabama back in the fifties and sixties, you know what I mean? Yeah. All, of, all, of, all the best players played for the black schools. They weren't allowed to go to Ole Miss and Mississippi State and places like that. So now, uh, these people dominate uh, college football because they get the best players and the best players, uh, nine out of 10 are, are black players. So um, I think when you put my my catalog or my music or the things that I've been able to do in context, not in context of fairy tale and folklore and a bunch of whitewash bullshit as, as, as what history is, but when you put it in proper context, you know, I think that uh, I don't know what more I could have done commercially. I don't know what more I can do creatively. But uh, to, to you know, I've found some success on my own terms. And I think I, I do understand how difficult that is. But uh, I don't think I'm, I'm in competing with anybody. I think you mentioned Joe Bonamassa. I hate to name somebody, but he's competing with Keith Richards in my book. Uh, Jimmy Page, he's not really competing with me and the guy that you mentioned from Memphis. Well, and vice versa. I don't think you probably wouldn't consider yourself competing with them. And and that, that's that was like the, my point of the question. And I appreciate that elaborate answer because it's like to me, you know, you are the model of, a, of success, right? It's not about you know how the huge album advances you're getting or huge you know publishing advances you're getting. It's like that balance of having that commercial success that you've had but then still being able to be true to your art form and be true to yourself like every step of the way. And, you know, cause that's, that's the tough thing. I think so many professional musicians, you know, they, it, it's tough to do what you've done, right. To have that literally that kind of statistics, you flip over the Chris Thomas King, you know, professional musician baseball card thing. It's just stat, 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 stat. And then, but then people might be like, you know, and this is, you know, and it, this is stuff that frustrates me. It's like, who's Chris Thomas King? You're just like, yeah, yeah come the fuck on. No, it's not the dude from Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? It's, it's, well, yes, it is, but it's just like, you know, so it's, I, your your answer is spot on. I mean, it's not, you know, that is success, right? And I think it's, you know, more, you know, up and comers need to hear that stuff. And more. Well, if you put it, if you, and that's why I appreciate you guys giving me this forum because I get a chance to speak in more than just a sound bite or a quoted in a sentence or two, you know? So, uh, but, um, but I, um, I, um, as far as people knowing who I am, I couldn't tell you uh, who's playing baseball in the World Series this year. I have no idea. And I couldn't tell you who won the, the Nobel Peace Prize last year. And I mean, I don't, do, you, is, do you even know that the playoffs started in baseball? Do you have any idea at all? I, I don't, to be honest with you. <laughs> I love it. Yes. So I'm just saying that, you know, I mean, if you're not paying, if, you, if you're into the blues, then you're going to know who Chris Thomas King is. I, I, but I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to, uh, you know what I mean? I, I, I kind of know where my lane is and I kind of do my thing here. But I'm here if people want to find me. I mean, uh, but I'm not uh, 
concerned with being on uh, these foolish TV shows and stuff. And they don't even pay you when you're going like the Tonight Show. I mean, I went on, nope. I went on David Letterman and stuff. They didn't even hardly want to pay. It's like I, I learned the hard way. One of my, uh, one, one of my good friends, uh, Alex Revis, she's the tour manager for Chronix, and you know they don't they, pay enough money on, on on these TV. They don't pay you nothing. No, they want they, you to do it for free. They did a. Like, no, man, no. I'd rather play in a joint in New Orleans uh, to a rather little crowd or stuff, man, and, and get more satisfaction than you know being on uh, some ridiculous show that nobody, at least nobody that really cares about my music is really watching anyway. So I'm not here to be like, uh, I never saw, you know, I don't think, I don't think Bob Marley would have been on, you know, singing search or star search, or whatever these things are called, dancing with the stars. Now, I mean, this stuff is like, uh, that's why I don't watch television. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I, I try to follow the news. I watch live events like live sports or some breaking news or something. But generally, man, uh, I, you know, a lot of this stuff numbs our minds, and that's why this is a, a, a dark time, but an enlightened time that we're living in because people finally had a chance to not go to work, to not, you know, be on the grind, be on the treadmill, and had a chance to kind of think about things and, and get beyond just a click or two and kind of absorb the fact that African Americans who are still poor and every immigrant have come in and passed us passed us by. Is it because there's something wrong with us innately? Are we just subhuman people that no matter how much money you throw at us, we're going to still be in poverty. So it's a waste of money to, uh, to invest in these communities and invest in people. Or, or should we just try to lock up as many of them up as we can, you know, to warehouse them in these, in these prisons, which is kind of what I'm hitting at with um, Angola. Right. Or are we just as human as everybody else? And this is just a racist ass, you know, uh, country that we live in. And, you know, uh, and, 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 and it's designed for you uh, to be in this position. And for a long, for, for you know, people just, uh, you know, Anglo people just can't hear what you're saying. But all of a sudden this summer, people have been able to hear us, you know, Black Lives Matter and, and Colin Kaepernick is not playing in the NFL, but do you want to just be a, a journeyman in the NFL? Or do you want to be somebody that one day they're going to build a statue to, which is Colin Kaepernick? Colin Kaepernick is a modern day, uh, like the lady that sat down on the bus and didn't get off, you know? Um, he's an icon of, 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 of this movement, and he was demonized by all the NFL people uh, years ago, so sometimes you just have to choose your path. And I'm not saying everybody should be a Colin Kaepernick or everybody should be a Chris Thomas King. Neither am I comparing myself to Kaep Kaepernick. But I'm just saying you got to choose your path and let time. And when and, and when people are ready for you and ready to accept what you're what you're doing, you know you're there. You know, and I and like I work in art, so you got artists like Basquet who's a painting, trying to find one of his paintings today, which he was handing it out on the street in New York, you know, at one time. But now if you don't have like 30, 40 million dollars, you might not be able to get a, a basket painting. So in art, sometimes it takes, it's in, a, it's, you know, it's subjective and everybody don't get it all at the same time. It takes time sometimes too. But hopefully the, 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 the music that I'm producing will have a long shelf life and, and have some meaning to people even when I'm not here, and uh, as opposed to just a quick commercial um, buck, you know, selling detergent or uh, some perfume or something. So we're not going to see Let you on the side pod commercials. <laughs> let, let me get it back to Angola for a minute then, because, yeah, we, we do want to promote the album. Where is the place that most benefits you to have people spin it? I mean, is it Spotify? Is it somewhere else? Uh, where uh, it, it benefits me where, where because, like I said, uh, uh, most of my catalog are, are on it all, so it's not, it comes directly to me. And if you guys look on the screen, you'll see the link to Spotify. If you type in Chris Thomas King and Spotify, you'll find it. And I've been, I've been curious about this because we talked about the last album, and you truly make albums. You were talking about it earlier. And, and uh, in the last one, you had the Jelly Roll Suite. In, and it's hard to even find someone mentioned the side A, side B difference. And, and yet, it's almost like it's two EPs. They're so different in construction. 
And then you talked about the album construction on this one. And I think you're very, like you nailed it. When I listened to it, I heard the, the Pink Floyd thing where you could just let that thing play in a half hour long loop. And you would, you would almost, it'd almost be hypnotic. Like you wouldn't have to turn it off because what the black community experiences is cyclical. You go right back to, you know, to right back to the chants in the streets. Like, God damn, how many times do we have to go through this? Right. So I love that you did that. Um, and I see your smile because I, I'm, I guess I'm getting that right that I got it. But the, the question I have is the construction of an album. Is that important anymore? No. Okay. It's kind of, it's kind of old fashioned. It's kind of arcane actually to even think about music and, and albums. And that's that that was part of the challenge, you know, uh, Peter, because my thing was I'm I'm trying to get people to to listen at this as a as a suite of music, as a body, you know, of music with some different movements and things. And I'm dealing with an audience, a blues audience that's been trained to not even think of blues as being art, you know. What I mean, it's like, you know, but uh I uh that was the challenge. How do I uh sequence the album, how do I tie it together to make it have that kind of meaning. And uh, I found some little technical um, loops, some kind of little things that I could figure out to do that to force the, the, the services to when they put it up, there is no there is no space in between the songs. Mm -hmm. And I made sure the songs bled over each other. But at the same time, they have to have a particular marker so that if somebody do want to put individual songs on a playlist or if it's put it on a CD into your CD player, it's separated, you know, it's not just one long song, you know? Uh, uh, so uh, I think Prince had a song called, uh, an album called Love Sexy that just goes straight through. And if you want to skip through it, good luck with that, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, you know, but, uh, but, I, but, but Pink Floyd is, uh, is somebody I kind of grew up on really digging, you know, the way they put albums together. And uh, the final cut is one of one of my. Uh, it's not one of the most popular album, but it's one of the ones that I really like by them. And it's a kind of quiet, you know, uh, a kind of quiet one of their quieter albums. But but yeah, um, and then you know, as far as storytelling with the with the album, it's, of course it starts with the chant, you know, George George Floyd, and I'm trying to get the rhythm on the guitar, and then it goes into the uh, a song called the flag which is, I spoke about Colin Kaepernick, it's kind of like taking a knee, you know, um, to the national anthem. Now, the thing about that is, and then you hear the police sirens, you hear the, and when you hear this bell ringing, just so people know, when I'm watching on Periscope, when the marches would come down the street, they were coming down the street in Manhattan, and there was a guy with, a, with his camera uh, this white guy with a, with a camera and they had some other white guy, but they had their faces covered and they broke the windows into this jewelry store. Was it a jewelry store or some kind of, you know, upscale store? And then the bell started going off, you know, in this in the store uh, for the break in. And they would they would go right ahead of the marches and break in. And then when the marches came down the street, they were expecting the marches to go run in there and uh, the process to go run in there and take. And then they were there with their cameras ready to film it so they can use it for propaganda, you know, and they were, and then so when, but when, when the marches came, the leaders of the march stood in front of the, the place that was broken into and they told everybody to keep going. Don't, don't, you know, don't take the bait, keep going, everybody keep going and keep marching. And so um, in one of the songs, you hear the bell ring and then you hear the guy saying, I'm getting out of here. It's not worth it. You know, I'm going to my car or something. Yeah. But he had just got chewed out. I couldn't put the whole thing on there. But he had just got chewed out by one of the marches saying, who are you with? Who sent you here? Who are you with? Who are you with? And you just know he's with some kind of right wing propaganda website or, or, or whatever, you know. And they use this this information to try to create because the guys that broke in the store they st they didn't even go in to take anything they just broke in and then they're waiting for the marches to come. It was the same here in Portland. The in good position, them. everybody's ready, but these guys chewed this guy out and they didn't jump on him. But then he you could tell he he was pretending to be interested in the march, but when they didn't go into the the store and and and, and loot it. Then he just say, "I'm going home. You know, it's not worth it." I'm, I'm, I'm just, so he was going to his car. But if you were really following the march and documenting the march, why not just follow him and keep walking with the marchers 
to see where they're going or whatever, you know? He wasn't interested in that. He was there to, to, to capture propaganda. And, you know, um, so the album can't tell the whole story, but I was just trying to tell the story that people were not seeing, you know, probably in, 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 the, in, the, in the CNNs and, the, and these kinds of uh, networks. They're not designed for that. And that's kind of the beauty, uh, you know, uh, social media, it has its aspects for, 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 for giving voice to people, you know, but at the same time, there's a whole lot of misinformation and propaganda out there. And, you know, um, and the sad thing is that, uh, you know, especially after Donald Trump's, uh, you know, bizarre, you know, crazy debate, if you want to call it that, the sad thing is that it's not Donald Trump that is the, that is our problem. There's a third of Americans that is the problem. And there's a third of Americans that's, we can't be civilized, you know, as long as we have a third of people who are still back in the dark ages, you know? And, uh, and that's, that's the dilemma, but the, but the, the CNNs of the world, they can't call these people out because they, the advertisers need these people, you know? And they don't want to alienate a large block of the audience, but they keep pointing at Donald Trump and he is not the main problem. He's just the leader of these people. And these people are holding us back. You know, they don't, they, they, the ignorance can't be penetrated. You can't even penetrate their ignorance. No, they'll justify it in some way. Yeah, and, and so what's shocking to me, I'm not shocked by a lot, but what's shocking to me is that there's such a low, I mean, I can see 10%, 15% maybe, but I just can't see 40%, a third of this country uh, being so ignorant, willfully ignorant, you know? You can't even penetrate the ignorance. So you, you're not able to show them the facts. You're not able to show them science that are wearing a mask, you know? <laughs> Is 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 scientifically it's going to help you not spread the the virus? I mean, and then we got people that want to argue against that demon theme and all kind of just crazy shit. It's like, you know, we just you know they they want to bring us back to the dark ages. You know, build a just build a wall and fulfill the moat with alligators. What is this, King Arthur? I mean, this is like it's insane. So, but the uh, but the the media. Who gave us Donald Trump by by putting his rallies on TV when he didn't have money to even buy advertisement? That's how they got him elected because they were desperate for the money, and they sold us out. And they're probably going to sell us out again because they really shouldn't have any more debates with this man. They really should just cancel the debates and not give him that airtime because he can't afford to buy it. We, we know he's broke, you know, and uh, and I don't think anybody's going to give him any money because he's just going to steal the money. And uh, he's not going to put it into the campaign anyway. So he's going to take your campaign money and, and pay his taxes and stash it somewhere, and use it to pay off some some debt or whatever. And so it's like, uh, but the news media want want those clicks. They want that. They want this create a Super Bowl, you know, and have people watching for advertisers and stuff. And so they they're not helping. You know, well, it's that not- cartel you were talking about, right? They got to sell Cadillacs. They got to sell soap. And if they can't do that, they can't exist, and that's not going to happen. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not that complicated to plant an apple tree, water it, take care of it, and then go and pick you an apple. But we have a society that they have to figure out how to not only make money off you getting picking getting that apple, they got to make a, an obscene amount of money off of you getting the apple. And getting an apple is a, a, a fresh egg is just not. It don't have to be that complicated, you know, but they got to squeeze, not just make money. We understand you got to make money, but do you have to make some obscene amount of money in order to to get me that apple so I can have a fresh apple to eat? You know, so we our, our, the structure of our society is on the brink. And I think that uh, the problem is get, once you get rid of Donald Trump, there'll be another one, you know. But the problem is a third of this country just uh, is not ready to move forward into the 21st century, but they don't have a choice. But we have to do, we have to figure out 
We can't apologize for the truth and we can't apologize for science and we can't apologize for facts. They just have to accept that. And if they don't accept it, then I guess as a society, we have to figure out well, what we're going to do about that. Are we going to just live with, with, with all this craziness? Or are we going to try to do something about it? Because, you know, our children, we can't go to school. We can't go to work. I can't, I, I, I'm not going to be playing a gig anywhere to promote, you asked me about promote my album. I'm, I'm hoping that I can make it to Broadway in, in August of next year. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's like a year from now. I'm yeah. hoping that we can get back to some kind of normalcy uh, or, or, or get things open again. But we're never going to get them open again if people don't wear a goddamn mask. I mean, a mask. We're just talking about wearing masks, man. They wear, they got on pants. They don't show up butt naked at the, at the at the grocery store. But if you tell them to put on a mask, they got a weave on. You know, they got they got some plastic surgery, but they can't put a fucking mask on. Yeah. What the fuck is that? Yeah. It's insane. I, I don't and, know if you guys and, saw the uh, the South Park episode special last night where they did this pandemic special thing and just like, you know, making fun and poking fun at all this stuff. And they're doing talk on the mask thing just because so many people are like, just put them on their chin or below the nose. And so they're calling them <laughs> chin diapers on the episode last night. And they're like, put your chin diaper over your nose. And, I miss I, I, I miss I miss South Park, man. Sometimes they can. Dude, put you got to watch the one yesterday. The panda. It was like an hour long special, all about what's been going on over the last five months. The police aspect, like it's you know, because they're so relevant. Like that's why they they sustained that for so many years is because they're you know the the world serves them up all of their episodes and the I would highly encourage you, this weird. I'm not endorsed by fucking South Park. I'm from Colorado, but um, it, it's I would check it out. It, yeah, it's I, I, I love it. And the thing about it. South Park. Um, let's let's bring us back to music a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, South Park, the national anthem, uh, the the song on my album called "The Flag," which uses the national anthem. To me, that's bluing. Um, that's blue entertainment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's naughty. It's not fit for polite society, so to speak. It's it's a French word that we in Louisiana have kind of uh, that we apply to our music called blue. You know, like soccer blue. Holy shit, you know, and so the blues that that that's the name. That's what the genre of music that I that's the philosophy behind it is that it's subversive, it's a provocative, it's free expression, you know, it's the First Amendment and you know, and philosophy embodied in music, and so it's free expression. But what makes it, what made it so powerful, is that it came out of free expression from the the old Victorian prudishness and the sensuality of the blues, kind of mixed. And uh, and the fact that the blues kind of everything that the the wasp uh, society held sacred, the blues was designed to upset it, you know, to piss on it, you know, so to speak, to say, hey, man, you know, I'm not going to convert, you know, I'm going to stay true to my culture and true to myself, and I'm going to blue this thing or creolize it, you know, and 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 do it my way. So I'll play your national anthem, Jimi Hendrix, you know, but I'm going to do it going to put my spin on it. I'm going to subvert it or convert it to, to my thing. Uh, you know, um, so when I'm doing the flag and I'm kind of using the national anthem, but I'm taking a knee. I mean, the national anthem, the lyrics to that thing, it was like a slave. They were there talking about, you know, uh, it's, it's really a slave anthem, you know, but they took a couple of verses out that had to do with slaves, but they kept the whole other parts of it. And it, I just think it should be thrown away anyway. I think we got enough talent here to write a, a better national anthem than what we have. And we can probably come up with some lyrics that can include Native Americans, African Americans, you know, you know, Europeans, Asians. It can, can include everybody, you know, in our mythology. You know, it's, it's okay to lie. It's okay. To, you know, every country kind of need a mythology to to rally around, because the truth is always, you can't rally around the truth, you know? <laughs> you, need a, you need a mythology. I'm not saying that, you know, but I'm saying that include me in the, don't make me out in to the be mythology. Yeah. You know, I don't do, I have to play the monster in this role, yeah. you know? So we have Walt Disney, you know, creating these, these, uh, you know, uh, Snow White and Hansel and Gretel and all these fairy, they tell you it's a fairy tale. Then why can't the prince be Asian? that come and kiss the lady. Oh, no, we can't do that because, you know, it has to be, you know, blue-eyed, blonde hair, you know, Norwegian-looking person. But I, I thought this was a fairy tale, 
does it really matter? I mean, it, it could be a, a bear that come to kiss it. Well, they'd rather have a bear do it than they would have a, an Asian man do it, you know what I mean? Or a black man or or whatever, you know? So this this these fairy tales and folklore that we have built a society on, it is a lie, but at least let's, let's lie and say everybody is great. Everybody is exceptional. You know, we all are one kind of thing. Let's 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 do it that way, you know. But uh, bluing uh, uh, the blues is not uh, the definition that they try to give you from the Mississippi Delta and plantation and all that. It really comes out of New Orleans. It's an enlightened music, and the music philosophy behind it is an enlightened music about freedom expression, freedom of expression. When you take a solo and get past what the conductor have written down and, the, and, and, and that real Sosa stiff march um, music. And then you take that and kind of improvise and do your own free thing with it. That's freedom of expression musically. That's the philosophy behind the blues. It's to break free of this wasp, you know, uh, you know, Victorian prudish tradition, which is, <laughs> which uh, is, uh, hypocritical anyway, you know, it's, it's hypocritical. So, you know, um, you don't have to aspire to that. You can kind of do it your own way. And that's the philosophy that runs th through my music. And I feel that the blues as we know it, you know, ostensibly the way that the Grammys uh, deal with the blues, the way Memphis uh, awards deal with the blues and the kind of people that they're awarding, it don't really have anything to do with, with uh, black music or black culture. And black people don't even come to the to the concerts or blues shows and stuff. It really is not a. It doesn't represent uh, African American music. It's really a uh, something that's kind of been hijacked, and a, and a whole different story that have been told. And and I was just saying I've talked to Peter about this in the past. Uh, and for people that are listening, that's maybe a little confused. I just need to give you a little background. Uh, when people tell you that the blues came from the Mississippi Delta, they have to remember that the Mississippi Delta only goes back to the early 1900s, like 1910, 1905. There were never any black slaves in the Mississippi Delta. There were never any black people in the Mississippi Delta during antebellum times. And blues started in New Orleans in the 1890s before there were even black people in the Mississippi Delta. So this whole idea about and all these early blues musicians, they weren't born in the Mississippi Delta. They were born south of Jackson, like, you know, things like this. And just to be clear, uh, no white people were in the Mississippi Delta either until Andrew Jackson moved those, uh, 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 those Indians, those Native Americans, Chickasaw and Choctaw Indians out of the Delta during the Trail of Tears around 1840, around the 1830s or so, they finally got the last of those people out of there. And so these people come in from Appalachia and, and places and come in there and take that land and take those people businesses. And they didn't do that until like the 1840s. And that was the first white men to come in there. But the black people never really uh, did anything in the Delta. There was any slaves there. So this idea that the blues came from slavery and all this stuff here, it's just not true, you know? Um, it took them 50 years after the Civil War to clear the Delta, to build some levees, to get, uh, and, and Stovall bought his plantation, I think, in 1895. And that's the Stovall plantation is where, you know, Charlie Patton and the Blues supposedly started. But that plantation didn't open up until the 1900s. But in New Orleans, Buddy Bolden, Jelly Roll Martin, King Oliver, you know, Lonnie Johnson, all these people had already established the Blues. The Blues had been there and gone by the time that it, it made its way to Mississippi. And then even the way it made its way to the Delta, after the New Orleans musicians left Louisiana and went to Chicago and started recording in Indiana and then Chicago, they made records. And Lonnie Johnson, the New Orleans guitar player, Lonnie Johnson, his records from 1925 started making its way to the Delta. And these, these, uh, these plantation workers like Charlie Patton and them would go to the commissary store, they'd get paid and Delta cash. So they couldn't use the money outside the plantation. So they would purchase things from the plantation store. And they would go to the plantation store and they would hear this music coming out of Chicago, you know, from the New Orleans musicians. 
And that's where you get Robert Johnson writing songs like Sweet Home. He want to go to Sweet Home Chicago. And everybody's talking about getting getting the hell up out to Delta and going and be like Lonnie Johnson. And uh, and so they didn't even hear this music until they heard it on wax. They didn't even know it, it, it existed. And then the first Delta uh, songs come out like in 1928, 29. And, you know, and then later in the 1960s, these folklorists uh, and, uh, and, uh, and social scientists and stuff, you know, what they did is they decided to try to create a false backstory for the blues to fit this idea so that white guys can go on and take this music and call it rock and roll and, and you know, they're great artists and, and they're geniuses and all this stuff here. And they had stole all this music from these people. From the, They had stole all this music but they created a, a fake backstory about the crossroads and all this stuff that never happened. Don't have, it's not black history. It not have anything to do with black history. And so my music is based in my whole music philosophy. And yes, I do. That's not an oxymoron. <laughs> you can't be a blues musician and have a philosophy, you know what I mean? Yeah. And be able to spell it, you know? <laughs> so uh, my whole uh, music philosophy comes out of a uh, New Orleans Enlightenment, and it made its way to Chicago. It eventually made its way to, to New York, and people called it swing. They call it jazz. They call it all these other kinds of names, just so they can kind of co-opt it, you know. But underneath it all, it is the blues, and so it's designed to to uh, to uh, make you know people polite society upset and bring attention to you know, something that you might be uh, one to bring attention to as an artist, you know? I mean, like NWA coming out, you know, F the Police, which I have a song on my album called The Police. My wife talked me out of calling it F the Police, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you have songs like this to point out it, with, with music, you know, that something is wrong here and that you don't, you know, you're disrespecting something they held, hold sacred. So Soccer Blue means... Uh, that you're cursing something that, that's sacred. But what is sacred about the national anthem is that it's, 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 it's an oppressive anthem, you know, for black people. And, you know, the police the, in their current configuration is oppressive. So uh, as, 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 as protests have it, have it, like the Black Lives Matter protest, and like my album Angola, it's a protest album. So it don't respect these institutions because they don't they're not worthy of respect. You know, I don't respect our current president because he's not worthy of it, you know. And so that's we in this country we have something called freedom of expression. And that's the almost the definition of the blues, you know, to express your 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 angst or your you know uh to be subversive. But let me just qualify it just a little bit because we're talking about South Park. Anybody can just curse and anybody can just say some old crazy stuff, you know what I mean? But where the blue, what makes it art, when Richard Pryor, he was a blue comic, but he could take reality, him and Chappelle, they can take blue entertainment and raise it to an art form. I mean, I don't like that Chappelle uses the N word, you know, so much and all this. But he can take that and turn it into art and make you think, you know, and kind of, you know, get get your get your mind open to, to some new ideas. And so the challenge is not to just be offensive like a lot of our hip hop is today, but sometimes people were being offensive to shock people into a new reality, you know. Um, you know, you wanna you don't want people to suppress your freedom of expression. So there's a fine line, you know, as opposed to just being filthy. Uh, just being subversive, just for subversive sake. That's not what um, that's not what the blues is. You know, it's a it's a higher thing that you're trying to reach, and you're trying to enlighten society and bring bring society, you know, out of out of a kind of darkness, if you will. And hey, Chris, when does your book come out? Is it is it almost done? I know you've been working on it for a while. And then who was your partner that you were writing it with? Isn't there a historian or somebody? It's available right now uh, oh. on Amazon. Uh, you can pre-order it on Amazon. The book is called The Blues, The uh, Authentic Narrative of My Music and Culture. 
And it's up for pre, a pre-order right now on Amazon, but it doesn't come out officially. Uh, it won't be released until June of, of next year. Okay. I'm put, I'm going to put that, uh, that link up on here and, and we've had you for long enough that my battery's about to die on my computer. <laughs> uh, so let, let I, me do I, feel, I feel like we're just getting started, man. I know. Oh, man, well, I, know. I haven't even gotten to get into, place, I haven't gotten know, even to the ask the gear right. questions yet. I mean, like I'm, I'm, I'm such a guitar junkie and you're talking about expression earlier. You know, I always love asking like some of these questions of, uh, you know, like what comes first, you know, the, the melody or the lyrics one and the same to you. I mean, I want to get into like what what's what was your you know your when you got your hands on your first whether it was you know Gibson Fender like what was that first moment where you like bonded with an instrument, the Explorer on your website like I mean there's like I want to I see the headstock behind you it doesn't look like a Fender but I'd be curious what kind of like boutique single coil guitar that is that oh, you got no. back there like, <laughs> yeah so that's a, that's a bass guitar uh, is that a, a modulus or what is that's a Music Man bass guitar yeah, five yeah. string. And I've, I've been recording all my albums with that. I play bass on just about all my albums. I have a great touring band, Jeff Mills and and uh, and and and, uh, and Danny Infante. But obviously, we aren't able to get together these days. Yeah, man, I can talk shop. I mean, I don't get to talk shop that much. Most people are so bored by that. Oh no way, not me, man. So I'll I'll bore the audience. I don't yeah, know. So, I don't know what kind of time we got, but like, if, let me start with this. Like, what was that first can, guitar I can you got? Get my power cord. You guys keep talking. And <laughs> what was? What was that right first back. guitar that, like, you know, I mean, you know, because for, for me, like, you know, when you get that first USA made guitar in your hands, you're just like, oh, shit. Like, yeah, oh, I had a, yeah, the first guitar that I really got that I could call mine was, uh, it was a, a, a little imitation Stratocaster guitar. I think it was called a Kent. Yeah. Yeah. And then I got an imitation Explorer, you know, back in the day. And, uh, but my dad had some really, really cool, like, uh, hollow body Gibsons, you know, like a 335. And uh, he had another guitar from like the 30s or something that I spray painted and he chewed me out. Yeah. And I wanted a black guitar and I spray painted his his sunburst, you know, hollow body, <laughs> electric acoustic, like a T-Bone Walker type, you know. Oh, that, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, I had that guitar today. It'd probably be one of my most ex, most uh, expensive or even, value. Even fashion. with your refinish, it'd still be. Yeah. <laughs> but uh but yeah, you know, I'm 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 uh, I'm neurotic, man. You know about my guitar tone, and uh, it, it, between uh, night between 2013, I think, and between releasing my album um, uh, Hotel Voodoo, uh, I was at a, I didn't release any music for four years, and that's a long time for me, you know. And uh, most of that four years, I was unhappy with the way my guitar sounded. And I couldn't figure out why, you know. Uh, Where, where'd you troubleshoot? You start at amp? Like, have you been a consistent like? Preamp. Amp? Okay. Well, preamps. You know, it's like okay, now I'm, I got my Neve preamps. You know, on ten eighty fours. You know, uh, I'm running those through, um, you know, eleven seventy six tube. You know, or LA two A compressors. Uh, okay, I, 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 the microphones, the ribbons. You know, I'm trying all kinds of different mics. Uh, I, I just totally didn't like the piercing sound of a 57. And so I'm looking for other, other things to do it with. And then, uh, you know, and then you got the right, and then you get to the amplifier, and then you get to the amplifier, and it's like, well, what's wrong with these tubes? Should I use the, uh, the 84s or, you know, you know, and so I'm trying to figure out the tube situation, and I'm still not happy. And then it's like, then they have to be hand-wired. And then, uh, so then it gets to the speaker. Okay, I got the right tube, I got the right pin, but then something's wrong with my speaker. And so I settled on the greenbacks, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the greenbacks. That's, and every time I play a gig, uh, my rider, you know, I always demand that they provide me with greenback speakers. It doesn't matter what the brand name is on the box, on the on the yep. speaker yep. cabinet. It's all similar wiring. Just give me the between tubes and speaker. That's, that's the combo. Yeah, so I need greenback speakers for my tone. But then there's a there's a local uh, amp some local amp makers here. Uh, I, I live right out between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, and there's some local amp makers. Um, they make an amp called uh, the Comet. Uh, are you, um, Supra? No, Comet. K O. Oh, that, that's the name of the brand. That's the name of the brand. Got it. Got it. Okay. And it is the greatest amplifier 
for blues guitar playing. Don't tell me that because now my now I'm gonna be justifying my to my wife the cost of the common app because <laughs> oh shit. Yeah, right. you know, because Marshall has the name, but unless you got a vintage Marshall that's in mint condition and all of this, just because you get the name Marshall don't mean that you have a Marshall. No. I'll you look know? at you right on their right on Comet's website with your explorer. Yeah, Comet makes the greatest amplifiers, handmade amplifiers that there are. And so that saved me, but then still. There was an issue. Now, the Comet don't have anything but just a tone knob and a volume knob. And uh, let me see, they got a yeah, tone knob and a saturation knob. It's like three knobs. And anything more than that, you start losing the purity of the tone. Yeah. yeah. Well, and Leo did, I mean, the, the, you know, the champs and like, I mean, starting on, it was just, you know, you didn't have masters, you didn't have gain channels. It was just exactly maybe, yeah. maybe two EQ. And when you play the Stratocaster, of course, I had a, prior to all of this, I had went through all kinds of different pickups, you know, trying to figure out what would be the right pickup. So I do have a humbucker on my bridge. Got to have the HSS. Yeah. And I use like a, some kind of 67. Uh, I, I can't remember the name right off the top of my head. But but yeah, so um, uh, I think I got a little 59 something on my bridge uh, pickup, nice and hot. Yep. And, uh, and uh, so all that's good. And then uh, so when I got that amplifier, and then I traveled with that with the head. Every, on all my concerts, you know, so uh, two, two twelve cabinet, single twelve. Like, what's your? It, it doesn't speaker? matter. It doesn't, doesn't matter about the cabinet, uh, as long as it has a greenback. Green yeah. One greenback is, you know. Now, the bigger the hall, if I'm playing in a, in a, in a, in a, at a festival or something, you know, then yeah, I, give me a couple of Marshall uh, cabinets with greenbacks if they can, if they have them. But like I said, it doesn't matter what brand the cabinet is, as long as it has a greenback. Because what happens with these, uh, with a lot of amps, they're designed for heavy metal. And in heavy metal, the speaker cabinets, the, the speakers, the cones, they're scooped out. The mids are scooped out. So you get the low end and you get the high end, and the mids are scooped out. And for blues uh, performance, at least for my tone, I need a, a boost on the mid, and I need the highs and lows scooped out. So it's more of a mid tone. And so when I go to a, a, a venue and I... And they bring me uh, 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 one of these uh, modern, you know, type of uh, cabinets, and you start trying to get your, you're trying to crank it up to get your tone to hear that mid tone, and you're constantly cranking those highs, and that's piercing to the audience ears, it's piercing to your ears, because you're boosting the highs way out of sync just to try to hear the mids. Yeah. And now you got to start dialing back your effects and dialing back this. And, and it's you're, like, ch you're chasing it at that time. Yeah, now you, you, you got a two hour sound check going on <laughs> just trying to, yeah. to get the mids to pop. So, uh, but if I get the green back and you boost that, you don't have to turn it up um, so, so, so much. You can play at a, 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 a lower volume and still get that dirt and the grime and the breakup you know, from, the, from, the, from, the, from the speakers. Do you, do you control like a lot of your breakup right on your volume, you know, like roll off the volume? Are you one of those players that really controls and to add in dirt or clean it up? Or are you more uh, uh, stomp box kind of person we are adding in the overdrive? Like do you set your amp at a higher point, roll off your volume, and then you, you know, control a lot of your, your gain just through your, your, your volume and tone or what, what's... Yeah, the beauty of the comment is that you don't need any, you can just control your, your, your lead and your rhythm volume just from your guitar volume knob you don't need anything special you, and uh because when you when you when you turn it up or turn it down uh it responds in a in a, in a certain way that you don't need a, i don't need any effects the only problem is they don't have reverb on their amps because reverbs take away from the tone as well right. so it, there's no reverb there there's no distortion whatever you have to turn it up to kind of get the speakers to break up a little bit to get a distortion what do you so, what do you use for uh, reverb wise are you pedal or are you going into a unit well, here's here's the thing about reverb. Now, for years, you know, I I was I was kind of set on the Fender Twin, you know, the Fenders. But the Fenders, you got to crank them up so loud to get a little bit of a breakup. Yep. They don't really work anymore. They're just kind of That's built for a different. <laughs> yeah, now that we have PA's and, and in ear monitors and stage volume way down. Yeah, yeah, you know, so um, loud amps just you know having a twenty five watt, thirty watt amp. It's plenty, you know. I travel with a 20 watt, a 19 watt uh, Comet mostly, but for festivals on my ride, I'll tell them to bring me, you know, uh, 50 watts, 80 watts, you know, whatever I might need, 100 or whatever. Or I'll, I'll, I'll 
patch a couple of a couple together, like my my, my comic with a Marshall head or something. But um, but reverb, uh, I don't use reverb as much as I used to. In the Fender, you get the built-in reverb, and it's nice, you know, that spring. But um, when it comes to reverb, I have a I have all kinds of reverb is one of my most. It is like you know because the, the way we record now. You know, we don't usually get into the big rooms and stuff to get the natural yep. ambience. Yep. And for years, man, and I, you know, recording albums and trying to get a guitar tone to work, you just can't get the, it's to sound like you're in a natural room. Yep. And they've all kinds of sample reverbs and this, that, and other thing. And none of those really work for me. But what, what, what I found that worked for me in the studio is the PCM70, the Lexicon, they don't make them anymore, but you can get them, you know, um, you can find some refurbished ones or something online if you're lucky to find them. But these things are just, they just make a guitar sing, you know? And so, and they, they have the, the, the most beautiful sounding, you know, dark delays. So um, for reverb and delay, normally when I'm recording, I'm using uh, my PCM70s. Now I do have a an outboard uh, spring reverb as well, that sounds like a plate, mm -hmm. but it's a real it's a real spring. And like on my album Voodoo Hotel Voodoo, you hear a lot of that mono spring reverb on the vocal and on the lead guitar, and it just kind of got a nice, um, beautiful wash there. That's kind of dark, and you don't have to do a lot of EQing and everything. But when I go live, I used to have to bring a, a huge. I used to have to fly around with a huge um, pedal board because I didn't always know what kind of amp I would get, what kind of shape it would be in. So for a Fender amp, if I'm just plugging into a Fender basement or a Fender twin, uh, to really get my tone, what really worked best was uh, was a, uh, uh, a fuzz face, you know? A, uh, a fuzz face like those 60s fuzz faces would be my main thing, and it runs by battery. And you gotta have the right battery in it, else it still don't, the, the tone gets a little thin, but it doesn't have a, it doesn't plug into the wall, you know, it doesn't have a, an AC or DC to it. And then, uh, you know, and then you have a nice delay and, and a tube screamer, you know, a classic tube screamer is uh, still a great yeah. go-to for blues yeah. guitars. Yeah. And then there's a lot of, you know, some color, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of a chorus or some other little effects in between, but mainly these days, all I need is my delay because usually the if I'm in a, a nice room, I'm gonna get some verb, but I try to use two delays, like a short delay and a longer delay. Kind of like a slap back. Me, yeah, that, that gives me my 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 reverberation um with my um with my comment. Is that uh, an always on type of effect for you when you're playing live? Just always having some slight delay, like a little slap back in there. It's like you know what I mean? Is there an always on type of effect like Reverb's, reverb's one of them for so many people to where it's just like a second, like playing live, just like the slightest little hint of it. Do you have like an always on kind of kind of effect when you're playing? It depends. It depends. Um, most most times I have a I have a basic setting, but then I have a couple of songs. Like there's a song that we do live that's a really 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 um, that's a number that is written around the delay. A song called Antebellum Postcards, which um, is played in a a real droning type of uh, guitar tuning. And that's another one of my problems. I used to travel back in the days, man. That's one thing about being with a major label, you know, when I was with with with, with, with the major labels and stuff, you know, you can travel with, with somebody to tune your guitars yeah, and, oh, yeah. and you can travel with seven or eight guitars and choose this tuning for that yeah. song. But these days I have to create my sets based on the tuning of the guitar. If I'm tuned in, in, in open D or if I'm tuned in uh dad gad or something like that then i kind of usually play the songs in that key before well, a, moving on to the next one there's a question right there like uh, yeah are you always playing in percentage of the time do you find yourself in standard tuning alternative tunings um uh, when i'm on acoustic guitar i'm never in standard tuning i don't have any tunes well my i rarely play in standard tuning on acoustic uh, and I don't use a capo very often. I hardly ever use a capo on acoustic guitar. I see people doing it, but it always confuses me, really. You know, the capo is more confusing than just retuning the guitar. And um, I got to get better at that. I got to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but ele on electric guitar, most times I'm in a standard tuning. 
I know I know that some people tune down to E flat, mm -hmm. but uh, I I don't understand why they do that. I don't think that really adds anything. And that's another thing. Uh, the, and the, the tone way. junkies will say it's because of like, well, depending on the scale length, you know, going to E flat, you get better tension. This it's just sometimes I'm just like, all right, let's. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just that Jimi Hendrix did it. Yeah, <laughs> no, dude. So so many things that guitar players do now, whether it's certain pedals are used or certain this, it's just because exactly it's like a. Stevie oh, Ray, Stevie Ray did it because Jimmy did it. Yeah, everyone's and, obsessed uh, with Dumbo. And then everybody else like, do it because because Stevie did it, you know, and, and on and on. But I think I think Jimmy did it because he came out of the military band thing, and you kind of were tuned the E to be in tune with the clarinets and other instruments in in, in the little military kind of setup. So, and and I don't know if it helped his voice or something, but he played on very light strings. So, yep. you know, I don't know why he did it, but to his ear, that just worked for him. And then uh, Stevie Ray, I think he would have broke all of the necks of his guitar oh. with those 13s on his, on his insane. guitar yeah. if he hadn't tuned down a couple of notches. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a good quote. What, uh, what gauge are you? Yeah. So that was the other thing I was going to say is that uh, my search, after I got all my electronics together, uh, my search was um, the guitar strings. And so my guitar strings, I, I used Gibson 10s, pure nickel. Okay. And nothing else will do. They so uh, are, are those round cores, nickel wrapped round cores, round no. core instead, or the hex core? No, it's it's pure nickel. Okay, okay. It's not like there's nickel plated, you know, where they have nickel and you've got the little wrapping around it. Yeah. But before before Vietnam, everybody played pure nickel pure nickel strings. There wasn't any other kind of string. So all those classic uh, guitar albums that you hear in the '60s, early '70s, there were no modern strings you know they were all pure nickel strings so even though you might have a fantastic les paul you know you, you you're probably going to get that tone that some of these records have first they plan the tape and that's a whole nother ball game trying to recreate tape on a in a in with ones and others in a digital format and that's that's important. And, and the right kind of tape too right we had west maybe on and he's like that whale fat tape sounds better than the modern tape as well um well, uh, most, people don't use, on that one. most people don't use real tape anymore, but there are some emulations of tape out there now yeah. that comes, you know, pretty close. Right. They come pretty close and guitars need that, you know, because it takes the bite and that piercing, you know, uh, right around 1.2K is where that piercing is, you know, and you got to either dip that down with EQ or you get a little tape on there, a little distortion, and it kind of just softens it for the ear. Because in modern music and digital music, now in the old school, in the, back in the day, you could crank the guitar up. It was the guitar, you can put it right out in front, and it would be okay on your ears, you know, because the distortion would soften it. But you can't put the guitar in front of music today. You know, it would, it would kill people. You know, it would just make you deaf, you know? So music, the guitar has to bag up in the digital realm, and so it can't be out front like it used to be. And as a blues guitarist, you're trying to figure out how to do that if you're not working with tape. So anyway, the guitar strings, the pure nickel strings, the Gibson pure nickel strings is what I've settled on. And once I settled on the pure nickel strings, and I had the knees, and I had the mics, and I had the cables, everything set, and the batteries, and the you know I had all my electronics in order. <laughs> See, I yeah. love I love hearing the psyche of the the especially a guitarist right there because it's just you go through you hear you hear the pain struggle of just like all right where is this it's the right battery it's the right speaker combination and it and that's what's funny too it's just because for you know it's it's like the Coke versus Pepsi kind of thing it's just like well it's just to somebody's ear like another guy would be playing that setup and be like oh, I don't know the the mids are off in my ear or this or it's just like that's that's did were you um, Guitar first or piano first or always, you know, like second you started. Well, I got, I got, I got, I got to finish this, this thing. Oh, oh shit. Sorry. <laughs> All right. See, he's not done yet. It wasn't solved just because no. of the stream. So, I, I, I told you it, it, it can get. No, I'm like, hey, I'm not, I'm not bored by any means. I can get in the weeds, <laughs> you know, uh, but it, it wasn't right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm recording. I, I, I'm hating what I'm hearing. And I'm like, I can't think anything else. And then I ran guys crazy taking my amps into the shop, saying, man, something. And they would just look at me strange, like, 
and they would hold the amp for a couple of months and not do anything to it and then hand it back to me and i'd be like yeah well it sounds a little better now but he hadn't even touched the thing yeah. and so everybody was just you know understanding he's chris is kind of weird you know his ears are kind of weird and he can't be satisfied so i got everything right and it's still off and you know what it was the last change i had to make my guitar pick yeah now you know that? Right all pick. right so what what were you using before what material celluloid Plectra. I was using uh, medium, like medium, medium, medium picks. Like, well, like what material though? Like fender mediums, like the cellular? Yeah, fender, fender medium. Right. Yeah, what, yeah, what yeah. Did, you, did you, so was it the the thickness, the size of the pick that you changed to? The material? Yes. Um, so now my tone is, um, is uh, what they call like a jazz three, this heavy, right. heavy, yep. small pick. Yep. yep. And once I put that to those, because a lot of people get a strat and they go through all these different pickups. And really what they need to do is get the right strings on the guitar for the kind of music they're playing. And so once I put that pick on there, then everything started singing. No, that's, you know, that's so and true. Then, I, then, then I could finish my mixes and I could finish my recordings. And that's how Hotel Voodoo came about, you know. Because um, of the that jazz whole, three. Yeah, that whole struggle. <laughs> and the last thing I'll say about the guitar strings and then I'll go to your question about the, the guitars. Um, the, like I was saying, the, during the war, um, they couldn't know, it, it, it got too expensive to make pure nickel strings around 19, during, during Vietnam. And so they started wrapping them and just giving you a little bit of, of nickel and then wrapping it with some other stuff, you know? And it made the strings cheaper. But then also the heavy metal guys, you know, in the 80s, they liked this bright tone that you get from these, you know, certain kind of strings and scooped out mids and all that kind of stuff. And they just kind of ruined guitar playing for everybody, everybody like me anyway. So, uh, but nowadays, um, if you want pure nickel strings, you have to uh, specifically ask for it or ask your, your store to stock it or find somewhere online where they still sell pure nickel strings. And one of the few companies that still, and they're all pure nickel strings aren't equal. Because they because they stay in tune, they tune up quick, and they stay in tune for a long time. But the Gibson Pure Nickel Tens, that's 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 what I put on my Strat, and I'll have to try the Gibsons. I've done the the DR Pure Blues. Um, I've done those. That's like a that's a um, uh, similar to the to the Gibson ones. And then there's company String Joy that's been coming up out of the woodworks. They're like boutique string manufacturer. Um, mm -hmm. They've been doing a lot of a, a lot of that. There's it's always a chase for the classic tone, and so whether it's. Let me ask a question as the non guitar player in this per, in this group. I am the combat guy, though, right? So when I look at my rig and what I want to get together, I also have to think about portability and mobility. You know, and every night you go to put your gear on, and you just look at that stand that has your shit on it. And you're just like, God, it's so fucking heavy. It like, what can I get rid of? You know, what do I need? What do I not? You know, and so there's always these compromises. You know, like in the movies, they've got 5,000 rounds. You can't carry that shit around. You just can't. <laughs> no. So is there a thing like that for you? Like where you're just like, I can't carry all of this extra shit. I need to find something that's elegant and then the compromises so that there are no variables because I can't go pull the weapon or, or grab my pencil and write and the lead breaks. I can't have that shit happen. I have to eliminate all variables. How does well, that, probably, what does that probably mean? Probably similar to application too in combat. So I bet I'd be curious your Chris's response. It's like the answer might be based on, well, what's the application? Mm -hmm. for? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that, I think that as a, uh, as monitoring music, you know, and monitors on stage, we're talking live, right? So monitors on stage and ear monitors and mixing um, and, and, and PA systems and stuff, you know, has, has, has really, really improved, you know, um, so you don't need a lot of stage volume. And so that have made it, it economical. Now, fortunately for me, you know, when I travel, I never bring my own amplifiers to gigs. Uh, the, it's, it's on a rider. So the promoter provides all the drums, keyboards, right. backline, whiskey, whatever we, you know, decide we need the chicks. I'm just kidding. Yeah. But we, uh, we, uh, we, 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 um, back in the day, that was the deal, you know, back in the day, you would bring all kinds of equipment and you set up this elaborate thing. Cause that was part of the show, you know, but, um, these days, um, these days, I basically just travel with, with, with that Comet head. And once mm -hmm. I get to the gig, I can, I can make almost any speaker 
sound good. Now, when I bring my pedals, I, when I was playing with fenders or, or playing other kind of amps, I'd have to bring a big pedal board like a doctor. You know, you don't know which one, which, you might not need all the pedals, but you better have them on hand just in case, you know, to make your adjustments, you, you know. But um, I don't need any pedals to plug into my um, my Comet, uh, uh, but the Tube Screamer helps and delay, you know, that's m my main thing. And then there's certain ballots and stuff where I might need a little, uh, you know, a little little chorus or a flanger or something like that. But I have a very, very simple setup, but it's just getting that tone because when you when you turn your, 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 when you crank yourself all the way up to 10 or you really get to wailing, you don't want people to be taken aback by some piercing tone. But you also want your music, want the guitar to be out front, you know, and for it to be right in your face at the same time. And so if it's going to be right in people's face, you know, it has to have a, a, a you know, a pleasing tone to it, you know. But but I, but, but I don't travel with um, rack gear. Back in the day, you would travel with rack gear and all that. But then you need a lot of help. But I just tell the promoter, you know, I need a guitar tech on hand or I need an assistant on hand or I need, you know, I just tell the promoter what I need. And usually they provide those things instead of me traveling with a guy to tune up my guitar, or traveling with a guy to, to set me up and stuff, you know. So I have a pretty economical um, little uh, travel, you know, tour travel situation that we do. And we're only a trio and uh, I play piano at gigs as well. But my PC, my PCM seventies, my Lexicon PCM seventies, my my uh, my rack gear and stuff, it just stays in my studio. It never, it never moves. How many guitars do you travel with? Uh, usually two. A uh, humbucker Gibson kind of style, and then a single coil, or just kind of very. No, I just I, I usually just travel with my Strat and with uh, with an acoustic. Uh, I have an, a Gibson a Gibson L two. And uh, and usually I travel with those two. I used to travel also with a J forty five, but the airlines have busted it up so so much. Um, yeah, FedEx, yeah. UPS, airlines they don't uh, they see fragile on an instrument even if it's in a Pelican case they can be pretty pretty rough on them. What kind of what kind of Strat do you have? Uh, I bought my Strat. The, the Strat that I'm that I mainly use now, I got that Strat around nineteen ninety or so. So it's kind of vintage now. But it was an American fortieth anniversary edition. And it's a blonde, and um, and uh, you know I've had the neck, you know, uh, redone a, a few times, and uh, it just it's 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 a beauty, man. And the, the nice thing about uh, Stratocasters is it's, they're so light, whereas like a you know uh, like a Les Paul is so heavy. You know, you can give you back problems almost. They're so heavy. Even if it's chambered, it's still looking at like eight plus pounds. Yeah. Now I have I have uh, some electric Gibsons. I got a hollow body Gibson that's kind of a three thirty five, and a Les Paul combined. Mm -hmm. uh, what do they call this thing? It's a one thirty four or something like this. But uh, it's a blue guitar. If you see me with a blue guitar, so it's a really nice. Uh, it's got a, it's got a Les Paul tone, but it's also hollow body electric. And uh, and then my Explorer, and uh, and my Explorer was destroyed during Hurricane Katrina. It was left underwater in my home down in New Orleans, um, you know, for like weeks, you know, it was underwater. <laughs> and uh, eventually I, I, I found a guy to restore it and with the original parts. Wow. Uh, and it, and, and uh, I think he even was able to use the original electronics, surprisingly. Wow. <laughs> but, you know, he re redid the, 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 the finish on it and everything. And so it's, 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 it's in great shape now. But um, but the thing about the Gibson guitar, the, the 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 Stratocaster guitar works good in a trio. So I travel in a power trio, and so a, a, a Strat can sing in that in that setting. But uh, the Gibson guitar with those humbuckers on it can blast through, yep. you know, and penetrate, you know, in a in a in a in a, in, 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 in a larger setting or whatever, you know. So if I'm doing something where I really, if I'm mixing a song and I want, sometimes on my songs I have five, six, seven guitars going. But if I want the guitar to be really rocking, say like the tune uh, on the new album, Angola, uh, you hear the my uh, Explorer on um, Jenna, Louisiana. And so that's doing the guitar solos and the picking. And it's got that pure, you know, you know, it, 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 it screams blues rock, you know? Yeah. 
and you can't really get you can get close, but you can't really get that with the Stratocaster. You know, the Stratocaster a little bit, bit of a softer um, instrument. You know, and it's a little more delicate. You know, but if you want to really cut through and just getting right down to it, you know, some ACDC or some, you know, whatever. You know, you really want to be in your face. You know. Some, you know, something about that middle position on a on a three way hum two humbucker guitar that just yeah does yeah on, even, on though, even though you use a humbuck on a strat it's not it's, it's close but it's not quite yeah so so sometimes when you're recording and you're painting a picture at least for me I'll use several guitars you know for different colors depending on you know what I want to do with but my main instrument and my main tone is is the Stratocaster through the Comet. What uh, on with that five way position? Are you predominantly in a certain position on the strat? Do you find yourself in like that? Where where do you find yourself kind of always settling? And and like and how often when you're on stage are you going from? I, I'd imagine it's probably like you know a good amount of like neck to bridge. But are you like how often are you like going you know up middle here? Like or do you kind of keep it set it and forget it? Mainly just neck and bridge on the five way or. It depends on the tune and even on the where I'm at in the tune. If I'm if I want to cut through, I have to use my humbucker. You know, so I have to go to the to the bridge, and but it's a thicker tone there. You know, it's not it doesn't thin out. It's really it really cuts through, and um, but if I'm doing like um, I'll be in the fourth position, you know, a lot of times if I because because then I can combine that that with this pure clean you know chimey you know mm -hmm. uh, tone of the strat. But I hardly ever go straight middle position, like okay. the third position. You're always com combining either neck and bridge or neck and mid or bridge. Yeah, two, mid. The, the second position and the middle position, I rarely use those. But, you know, the forward position I use quite a bit. And then, you know, for certain tunes, I'll use the neck position, which is, I, I get, I get a, it's a, it's a lower, it's a lower volume, but it has a certain fatness. Oh, yeah. You know, warmth, you know, There's that some... happened there, which is beautiful on balance. Yep. Yeah, something about that neck position on a on a strat is just yeah tasty. What's that? Go asking the so where did you start out as piano? What was your first instrument? You you started out like writing guitar, piano, and when was it when you like became like I'm a guitarist? Or do you consider yourself full mainly more guitar pianist? Oh yeah, you know, I'm a I'm a guitar player up so I, through and through. Uh, uh, the trumpet is my was my first instrument. I was gonna be you know a blues trumpet player. And I, I even when you say blues trumpet, that sounds weird because there are no, you know what I mean? <laughs> but that just shows you that there's no such thing as jazz. You know, there are no jazz trumpet players. Uh, they're all blues players if they're good ones, you know. Miles Davis played the blues, you know, so this is, this is, so anyway, I was going to be a, I was going to be a trumpet player. And I started off, off on the cornet uh, as a real, as a kid and graduated, you know, to other instruments and, you know, checked other things out, the piano, the bass, and then I landed on the guitar. And part of landing on the guitar was my father uh, kind of encouraged me that if you know, if you, if you want to be a band leader, you know, you should play the guitar, you know, because the guitar was the instrument that was the the, the trumpet led all was the the loudest instrument in the acoustic bands, you know, through the acoustic years. And so, if you wanted to cut through, you play the trumpet. If you wanted to be the leader of a band or really shine, or let your hear solos be heard. And um, and then the guitar came in and overtook the trumpet as the instrument of the blues. Now, I, it's all blues to me, you know, all popular music. So when we're talking country, rock, whatever, we, we're still talking blues. So uh, the, the guitar came on, but then Miles Davis decided that he was going to fight this. And he was like, I'm not going to let these guys, you know, come and take my music. You know, they playing my notes and stuff on the guitar. You know, I'm not going to let these guys. Do. So he started trying to experiment playing the wah-wah with the trumpet and, you know, some flange with the trumpet and playing the trumpet through a Marshall amplifier. <laughs> and it's like, Miles, it, it, it just ain't not working, bro. <laughs> it, ain't, this ain't, this ain't, it ain't gonna happen, man. You're gonna have to just accept that you, the trumpet, you know, has been surpassed by this, by this loud electric instrument. And he fought that for like a decade, you know, but you just couldn't turn that. Like, now, interestingly, the, the harmonica adapted well to electric to electronics. So some instruments adapted well to electronics, you know, and some instru instruments did not, you know. Um, Was your so first anyway, guitar acoustic or electric? My 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 early start. 
Your first guitar was it acoustic it, it, or electric? electric? The, electric. Yeah, the, it was a Stratocaster knockoff. Right, right, right. The Kent. Called the Kent. Yeah. yeah, that was my first uh, guitar that I could call my own. Before that, I always fooled around on my dad's guitars. But um, but yeah, so I mean, I, I made the transition just as the trumpet was making the transition to the guitar. You know what I mean? So I was going to be that trumpet player because my uncle taught me how to play trumpet, and I was going to you know play the blues on the trumpet, and then. Uh, I made the switch to the guitar, and I liked how much noise it made and things, and uh, and I just gravitated toward that. And you know, the rest, as they say, is history, man. That's awesome. That's incredible. But <laughs> we did we did two shows. Do you want to talk about anything else? You're on a roll. Uh, not too much. I mean, you guys asked me about piano, but I don't have a whole lot to say about piano other than you know I've been using piano as a songwriter for years. And, uh, you know, always, I've always used that as a songwriting tool. And now it's always a part of my show. If they have a nice grand piano in the room, something I'll, I'll always try to use to do a set, you know? So uh, it's become more and more a part of what I do. And then the other thing is, man, um, you know, drum machines. I mean, uh, you know, uh, right now, the PCX is, is just swinging for me, you know what I mean? So. You know, those, you know, um, trying to keep trying to get that tone, trying to maintain that blues philosophy and stay true to my culture, that Creole Louisiana culture where the blues came out of, you know, uh, back when my dad, when my dad had Tabby's blues, back, Tabby's blues box back in the day, you can go to any pawn shop and get a, a great sound of guitar. You can go to any pawn shop. All the all the amps and guitars in the early '70s and early '80s that might end up in a pawn shop, they were all great sounding. You didn't need a classic 1920s or so. It was like that was the era of, of great amplification. Nowadays, it's really hit and miss. You know, I, I got orange amplifiers. You know, I've tried I've tried everything. You know, uh, but like I said, the common now the common is a very expensive. Uh, amplifier. You pay for what you get in uh, in musical worlds for the for a lot of things, especially. But it, it'll, it'll save you on a whole lot of other effects and pickups and everything. When you combine all the things that you might have to do to reach that tone, it's a good investment, you know. But um, but yeah, man. I I guess I've been kind of you know. Uh, I haven't you know I haven't been out in public very much. Haven't talked a whole lot so. I guess I had a lot to say here. We, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. We have, but I think it's good, man. And and you also do a lot of stuff. I mean, as an artist, it's always great to watch you create, whether you're on stage during Lackawanna Blues, which everybody should go see, or your book, which is linked right here. I mean, I can't wait for that book to come out because I just wanted to dig in and have you on for, I don't know, three hours talking about that thing. You just do so much. So I appreciate you taking the time to kind of break all these things down because – it's special. And we need artists like you to illustrate uh, the problems of society because, you know, I think academically, you know, primarily, and I know that I can look at numbers and I can see the problem, but I also need the artist to illustrate the problem in a way that I can't see it or can't cognate it. And so thanks for doing that for all of us too, as we try to all figure out what it is that we're all trying to do here and, and how to, how to just, just take one apple off the tree, not to cut the whole fucking thing down and say, apple trees on sale for a dollar. <laughs> chopping them down to make money. So I, I, if nothing else, I appreciate you. Yeah, I thank, thank you for that, you know. And uh, and as an artist, that's that's what, at least, you know, most of us, that's what we live to do, you know, to try to, to bring beauty into the world, you know. It might, even though we might make some music that sounds that's designed to be offensive or designed to be ugly or designed to get your attention in some salacious way, you know, it's about trying to shock you or get your attention, hopefully not just to sell some product, you know what I mean? But hopefully to 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 touch, you know, your humanity, you know, for, to reach for our humanities to communicate with each other, you know, and try to try to beautify the world, you know? I mean, at least that's what I'm trying to do. And I think that's what the blues was, the philosophy of the blues is is, is all about. So, yeah. No, Pete, I appreciate, I appreciate you letting me Any last questions at all, Ryan, or comments? No, no, I just appreciate you letting me sit in and ask some gear nerd questions. And just, you know, Chris, I appreciate you just giving the insight. You know, it's with, um, I think there, there's, 
I worked for Fender Guitars for five years. I've been managing artists for a while. And like, you know, it's, there's so many assumptions and misconceptions about um, being a professional musician. And so it's like, I love getting to hear an accomplished person like yourself be able to, to speak. And, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be making all my guitar guys, all my guitar clients listen to this because I'm just like, see, you know, it's not just about, it's, yeah, it's not just about selling the records. It's like the combination of that and just being, you know, everyone started out playing music because it was a it was an emotional escape form. It was a release. It's therapy, right? And then, you know, as a professional musician, you get to a point where you blur that line and it's just how do you balance that, you know, the professional aspect, but this is still something that was, you know, it's self therapy. And, you know, I think the there's gonna be a lot of good that comes out of this period. I, I firmly believe in that. I have to. It's a half glass full, silver lining kind of mentality. And you know, um, it's it's a special opportunity. You know, when was the last time you've probably had this much time off? It's probably been forced time off. But, you know, so many artists I work with, they haven't had a summer off for 20 years. And so I, I really I'm excited, you know, over the next six years to see what kind of the re music that's going to come out of this, the recording, because it's allowed us, like you said earlier, Chris, you know, whether you're a musician or not, like hopefully this time has provided people a time to just kind of like sit back and fucking think whether that's about themselves, what they want to do with their career, whether about the world. And, you know, so it's. I, I, it's just been awesome getting to chat with you. Yeah, you know we we take we take these lemons and and hopefully you know these lemons of this pandemic and and make some lemonade, you know. And uh, yeah, so it, it was, it's been a pleasure, you guys. And uh, you know, I'm sure there'll be some things come up in the future that we'll that we'll we'll, we'll reach back in and, and and get everybody caught up on. So thanks for giving me a forum. Yeah, no worries. And I like to say, it's not half full, it's not half empty. I say, grab three shot glasses, put that shit three ways, let's do shots. <laughs> there you go. <laughs>